deep in the jungles of Cyrodiil, the Fire King Hud Hall emerged from the bowels of his great citadel. He stood atop the granite steps of Sayatar and bore witness to the full breadth of the firmament. He bade his retinue to snuff their torches, and he whispered an incantation to quench the flames that coiled around his mighty spear. As their firelight subsided, starlight took its place. Hardhall's warlocks lifted their arms toward the cosmos, arms adorned with feathers and magic beads. Their fingers jutted skyward like antennas to Aphirius, taking census of the constellations. At first, all the stars seemed a featureless mass of lights, like the sparks that fly upward from a pyre. Soon they began to see that some were brighter than others, that their colours were by no means uniform. Then, after a long time staring, a creature made itself known. Framed with perfect salience between two of Sayatartar's pure white columns, a snake seemed to spring out as distinctly as if the serpent's whole body had been powdered with the dust ground from diamonds. Once the celestial animal had burst into view, it became so strongly evident that it could not be dismissed. The Fire King beckoned his chief sorcerer then. He pointed out the sinuous pattern upon the night sky, and asked what this constellation portended. Are we blessed, or are we cursed? The warlock rattled the beads that dangled from his feathered forearms, and his response was dark and dire as the void. Some say the serpent heralds the trickster, my liege. Hard Hall howled with laughter. Perhaps the dead god will send a knight made of stars to slay us where we stand. And I pray he does, for I will skewer his heart just as Auriel the eagle did in the dawn. The warlocks mimicked their master's merriment, but a communal feeling of consternation crept over each and every alien atop Sayatar, for they had all heard the rumours, and each of them became minutely aware of their surroundings. The jungle was full of sound, insects buzzing, bats clicking, the sporadic croak of a frog by the pools, and high above, the unstars of Mundus's most ominous constellation continued to glisten. The snake writhed over the midnight abyss, and its relentless incandescence began to irritate their eyes. Even through the veil of their eyelids, the cosmic formation of far-flung flaming suns burned incessantly. To relieve the tension, the Fire King proclaimed, The jungles of Cyrid would sooner turn to grassy meadows than Pelennor the Mythic appear. And the thought of such a nonsensical notion eased their anxiety. Then the silence set in. The hum of the insect choir had dwindled away. The bats, despite their blindness, had sensed a stirring in the brush. Even the frogs had hopped along. There is something oppressive about true silence. The weight of absence becomes crushing. Call it instinct, call it paranoia, call it premonition. Whatever it was, it made the aliens draw their weapons and ignite their torches. With a flourish, the Fire King rekindled his flaming spear and the pristine white stones were illuminated. In the restored firelight, the tree line far below became visible, and that was when they saw him. From the understory he came. He was arrayed in armour from the future time. His brilliant white surcoat drank in the radiance of the serpent above. He climbed the granite steps of Sayatar, with a mace in his right hand and a spark in his left. The Fire King's guard formed a line on the uppermost step, and drew their bows. They loosed their bird-billed arrows in unison, and Pelennor traced their flight from far below. Like a murder of crows, the arrows reached their zenith, and then swooped. A flurry of ravening beaks fell upon the knight. Pelennor raised his left hand, and for a fleeting moment, the knight receded, and all was white. When it subsided, every elf was too blind to notice that the arrows had been shone out of existence. And when the Aeliads recovered their vision, Pelennor Insurgent had ascended the steps and was in their midst. Like a chain of lightning, Pelennor jolted from foe to foe. His mace crushed skulls and collapsed ribcages with visceral thumps. Hud Hall levelled his spear and sent a gout of flame at the night. And to his delight, it struck true, engulfing the white strake in fire. But his joy soured and fermented into terror when he saw that the White Knight was unfazed. His shining armour merely absorbed the fire, 
making the plates of metal glow. The heat radiating from the white streak formed a mirage around him, and to Hardhall's horror, he saw disturbing visions within their folds. Visions of all the torments he had afflicted upon the human slaves in his domain. Visions of nighttime tiger sport, where Nedic children had been set aflame for entertainment. When the mirage faded, the Fire King stood alone against Pelennor. His companions were scattered in bloody heaps upon the porcelain stones. Hardhall raised his spear once more and thrust it toward the knight, but Pelennor parried it with such force that the weapon slipped from the Aeliad's grip. Hardhall scrambled backwards, tumbling clumsily to the floor. Pelennor too dropped his weapon and straddled the king, almost like a lover. But the touch of the knight's white-hot armour seared the Fire King's flesh, and Pelennor showed Hardhall the meaning of white strength for he lifted his left hand, which was made of a killing light, and held it before Hudhall's face. The light was so ineffably beautiful as it melted his eyes within their sockets, and his terminal shriek echoed across the architecture until it soaked into the surrounding trees. When Pelennor descended the granite steps of Sayatar, he did so with a congregation of slaves and the slaves sang praise to Saint Alicia as they spat upon the corpses of their captors. This is the ballad of the Star Maid Knight. It is a song of legends and living gods, of empires raised and reforged. It is foremost a song of love and of loss, and it all begins with the lament of a lowly Nedic slave, who pressed her shackled palms together in prayer to the gods, for the races of men inhabiting the heartland had suffered for centuries under the merciless rule of the Aeliad Autarchs. It was a hopeless endeavour the slave girl knew, but there was naught left to lose. This slave went by many names. There was the elven name, Elestia, which is High Highness. There was Paravant, Paravania, and Perif, which is the first. Morahouse the Manbull, who will feature heavily in this tale, described Elysia's youth and the extent of Aeliad oppression in his memoirs. Perif's original tribe is unknown, but she grew up in Sard, a non Sardavar lead, where the Aeliads herded in men from across all the Nibbon. Men were given over to the lifting of stones, and the draining of the fields, and the upkeep of temple and road, or to become art tortures for strange pleasures, as in the wailing wheels of Vindazel, and the gut gardens of Cersen, and flesh sculpture, which was everywhere among the slaves of the Aeliads in those days. Or worse, the realms of the Fire King Hudhul, where the begetting of drugs, drawn from the admixture of Daedrons into living hosts, let one inhale new visions of torment, and children were set aflame for nighttime tiger sport. The elves of the Heartland had not always been such cruel tyrants. The Aeliads were one of the various Old Mary Splinter groups that made their way to mainland Tamriel in the Morefic Era. These groups diverged geographically, but also culturally. The Aldmer considered themselves to be descendants of the gods, and therefore superior to the races of man and beast that inhabited the land of Dawn's beauty. The Dureni settled in High Rock. The Kaima eked out a precarious existence in the largely inhospitable northeastern realm of Resdane, now known as Morrowind. The Aeliads chose the heartland of Sirit, which looked nothing like it does in more recent eras. Back in Morefic times, Sirid was mostly an endless rainforest, more tropical and humid back then. Though full of fertile soil, the southern reaches of the region, fueled by great rivers, were swamps perilous to navigate. A unique aspect of Aeliad culture is the avian imagery. Of course, the High Elves believe Auriel was an eagle, but the Heartland Elves are often described as being adorned in feathers, fashioning arrows that resemble bird beaks and their most illustrious sorcerer king even went by the title of Unfeathered. This fixation on the ornithological is likely due to the presence of a forgotten beast race that once dwelt in the heartland. According to the fragmented journal of Topol the pilot, the old Mary explorer who was the first to chart the mainland, when probing the rivers on his ship named the Nibbon, Topol the pilot was enchanted with the islands and the feathered men who lived there. There the Nibbon stayed for a moon, and the birdmen learned how to speak their own words, and with taloned feet to write. In joy for their new knowledge, they made Topol their lord, giving him their islands for the gift. 
It is theorized that the alien settlers interacted with these sapient birds. What is rather sinister though, is that these bird people vanished from Tamriel and were not remembered in the histories. They were replaced by the aliens, and judging by alien culture and dress, it would seem that the elves absorbed their avian culture, before gradually erasing the race from Sirit. According to the captain of the Leowin Coast Guard, Decentius Opsius. Back in the Merithic, he charted the sea lanes and explored the River Nibbon. Torval sailed all the way from Topol Bay up the Nibbon Valley. He purchased the Eight Islands, the site of White Gold Tower and the Imperial City, from the Beast Folk natives for the secret of literacy. Pretty soon, the Beast Folk all knew how to read and write, which was handy, since it made them better slaves for the aliens. <laughs> it appears as though this treatment of the Bird Folk would be consistent with the aliens' foreign relations in their new homeland. There were also Nidic humans living in rudimentary settlements across the heartland, and as stated in the Pocket Guide 3rd edition, the ancient Nidic people, spreading south from Skyrim, became the slave labour for their ambitions, centred around the White Gold Tower. The Aelids constructed an empire so grand that it would stand supreme for all time. Every citadel was built from enormous white stones, too great to succumb to the slow death of erosion and at the pinnacle of this legendary empire was the crowning achievement of alien architecture. The Tower of White Gold, made in open emulation of Adamantia, constructed by the gods in the dawn. This megalith was a testament to the hubris of the aliens. They saw themselves as equals to the gods, erecting edifices that would never wear, and would stand as tall as those built by the founders of the mortal world. And all these feats were made possible thanks to an endless influx of needic slave labour. Alas, the grandeur of these citadels, and the uncompromising governance of their many kingdoms, corrupted the supercilious aliens. Their treatment of lessers strayed from the practical and into the sadistic. Of course, treatment of slaves varied between kingdoms. Despite some monarchs holding more influence and territory than others, each kingdom was somewhat independent. Culture and spirituality varied as it does in any significantly sized society. Unfortunately though, very few kingdoms seemed capable of resisting the malignant spread of Daedra worship throughout the starry heart of Nern. The Aelids had been fervent worshippers of the Aedra. The White Gold Tower, which they referred to as the Temple of the Ancestors, was the monumental indicator to this fact. Over time, and in most Aelid citadels, this degenerated into Daedra worship. It's hard to determine whether this descent into depravity was a natural consequence of total domination over a lesser race, or the malevolent influence of the Daedra lords themselves. You can imagine some princes would have watched the proliferation of Aelid dominance with great interest. According to the prolific imperial scholar Frastus of Elenir, in the last millennium of the Merefic Era, Daedric worship took hold and spread among the Heartland High Elves. The Aedra were still widely revered, with probably a majority of the Aelids continuing to pay them homage, but cults devoted to the various Daedric princes sprang up across Cyrodiil, tolerated and then celebrated. Unlike the Kaima, the Aelids made no distinction between good and bad Daedra. Indeed, even some of the more heinous princes received mass veneration, especially when their worship was adopted and endorsed by alien kings and aristocrats. Despite the abundance of veneration for illicit spectra, there are only a few Daedra lords that we can say without any doubt fraternised with the Heartland Elves. And of these few, there are two who are especially prevalent. The first of these was Meridia, and this relationship makes a lot of sense when we look at her sphere. Meridia was once an Aedra, and she is the Lady of Light, the sacred fourth element in Aelid culture, and she supplied Aurorans to bolster the armies of the Aelids. The second prince is Molag Baal. Need I explain why the Lord of Domination would want to persuade the Aelids into excessive cruelty? After turning to Daedra worship, the slaves of the Aelid Empire were no longer used for practical purposes, but were the subjects of torture as an art form. And this is where Aelid arrogance augured the end of their glorious empire. Some Aedra worshipping cities would endure the inevitable insurrection, but those that participated in Daedra inspired brutality would suffer the brunt of the counterblow. 
From the Song of Pelennor, a text we'll be citing often throughout the video, Perif spoke to the handmaiden again, eyes to the heaven which had not known kindness since the beginning of elven rule, and she spoke as a mortal, whose kindle is beloved by the gods for its strength in weakness, a humility that can burn with metaphor and yet break easily, and always, always doomed to end in death. And this is why those who let their souls burn anyway are beloved of the dragon and his kin. And she said, And this thing I have thought of, I have named it, and I call it freedom, which I think is just another word for Shazar who goes missing. You made the first rain at his sundering, and that is what I ask now for our alien masters, that we might sunder them fully and repay their cruelty by dispersing them to drown in the topal. The slave girl, Perif, before attaining the title of Alicia, spoke to the handmaiden. Alicia had not created the Cyrodiilic pantheon of the Eight Divines yet, and so the gods she spoke to were the Nordic versions. Shaw was chief of the gods, Kine was his wife, and Mara was Kine's handmaiden. So it was Mara who served as the messenger between mortal and divine. She discovered that freedom is synonymous with Shaw, Lorcan, Shazar. I believe she draws this connection because Shaw is the god of men, and he would not allow the races of Mur to subjugate his flock. Emboldened by her communion with the gods, Alicia orchestrated a revolt within Sard, overthrowing the jailers and emerging to the surface as free men and women. But it was at Sancrator where the slave rebellion truly took shape. Perif beseeched Kine for aid once more, for the slaves alone could not supplant an empire and Kine gave Alicia three holy visions, which manifested as three blessings. The first blessing isn't explicitly stated, though it may be the aid of her northern offspring, the Nordic Children of the Sky. The second was her demigod son, named Morahaus. Mighty and snorting, gore-horned, winged, he flew down to Nern as the embodiment of anger. The Song of Pelennor proceeds to say, and then Kine granted Perith another symbol, a diamond soaked red with the blood of elves, whose facets could unsect her and form into a man whose every angle could cut her jailers, and a name, Pelin El, which is the star made knight, and he was arrayed in armour from the future time, and he walked into the jungles of Sirid already killing. Morahau stamping at his side, froth bloody and bellowing from excitement, because the Pelinal was come and Pelennor came to Perif's camp of rebels holding a sword and mace, both encrusted with the smashed viscera of elven faces, feathers and magic beads, which were the markings of the Aelia Dune, stuck to the redness that hung from his weapons. And he lifted them, saying, These were their eastern chieftains, no longer full of their talking. Thrice blessed, Alicia knew that her rebellion was backed by the gods, and the Aeliads would know retribution a diamond soaked red with the blood of elves. This diamond is the ruby gemstone that would be placed within the golden bezel of the Amulet of Kings. It was a huge soul gem that the Aeliads called the Kim El Adabal, translating loosely to Royal High Spirit Stone. At the convention which ended the dawn and began the mortal errors, Trinamak ripped Lorcan's heart from his chest with more than hands, and Auriel fastened it to an arrow letting it fly long across the continent. The heart landed in the Padamaic Ocean, and it became the seed from which sprouted Red Mountain. And it is believed that, as the heart soared through the sky like a crimson comet, a drop of Lorcan's divine blood fell upon the heartland of Sirit. One poem titled, Kim El Adabal, A Ballad, says, The laughing heart sprayed blood afar, a gout on Sirid fell, and like a dart shot to its mark, down in an alien well. Magicka fused the Lorcan blood to crystal red and strong. Then wild elves cut and polished it down to Kim El Adabal. This almighty gem became the stone of the White Gold Tower, an artifact dearly beloved by the aliens. But Kine, on behalf of her husband Shaw, who is Lorcan, whose lifeblood lent the gem its beatific spark, took the relic from the elves and gave it to the human slaves. From the Kim El Adabal, the glorious spirit stone, came the Pelin El, the glorious knight. Powered by a single drop of Shaw's ichor, 
Pelennor would give the Crusades a face, and he would show the imperious elves that the Merefic times were gone, and the time of man was at hand. Now that Pelennor has come, let us take a moment's respite. And what better way to take a break than for us to hear a word from our sponsor? The Library of Dusk's Rare Book Collection for complete access to over infinity and eight never-before-read texts, each of which guaranteed to cause amnesia, insanity, or zero sum. Please visit the Library of Dusk in Cold Harbor, just west of the Hollow City. Today's excerpts come from the only known existing copy of Conversations with the Heart of Lorcan by Pelinal Whitestrake. Warning, the apocryphal ruminations held within these pages should be consumed at one's own risk. Chapter 1. Paternus I sought solitude atop the tor. I intoned the orbic hymn. I opened my solar plexus like a lantern in the abyss, and my red diamond core became my alto antiphony, singing like a many-faceted dragon. The composition of light and sound attracted the moths. I could not sleep, but I longed for silken dreams. So when my flitting mantle took shape, I asked them to lay their eggs upon me, and due to the timeless nature of the orbic hymn, those eggs became caterpillars, and those caterpillars span for me a pupa. I watched as they worked, and as the starry night turned to the deeper darkness of my cocoon. When it was done, I walked the Mundus in spirit only, across a phantasmagorical landscape where time and distance were subjective, and I went to visit my father. Encased in igneous rock I found the divine spark, for his rhythm spoke in penetrative pulses. He formed for me a chamber, and I knelt before him. We did not communicate through language, through words structured into meanings. Instead, there was an intercourse of resonations. For you, dear reader, I shall translate, though Lorcan's rumblings are ineffable. I asked him of my nature. I asked him why he would not take credit for facilitating the Elysian Uprising. I asked him why he chose to don his ancient enemy, the Time Dragon, as a disguise, surrendering all acclaim. I wondered whether his willingness to have the Kim El Adabal be recognized as Auriel's artifact was my father's way of forsaking me or protecting me. And most profound of all, I questioned why I cared to know. Was I not a stone-hearted cyborg? Why should I seek my father's approval and feel an avuncular bond with Mora House? Would my love of man hinder my divine purpose? The heart of Lorcan thumped, and meaning poured into me. Love is not a hindrance. Love is the death of self-interest. In fact, love was the answer to every question I had posed. While Perif and Morahouse spread slowly across Sirit, amassing an army great enough to march upon the city of White Gold, Pelinor travelled the heartland alone invoking the conceit of the Sorcerer Kings, challenging them to single combat. The Aeliad Tyrants were no fools. They did not underestimate the Star Maid Knight. If anything, they held an apprehensive reverence for him. Self-preservation would have counseled the Kings to reject Pelennor's propositions. But pride and a need to demonstrate power before their people forced their hands. One of the most notorious instances took place at Sancrator, at the heart of the rebellion. It was a resounding victory that instilled hope within the hearts of the liberated slaves. Pelinor called out Haramir of Copper and Tea into a duel at the Tor, and it was on this day that the gathered masses gave Pelinor one of his epithets, Pelinor in triumph, as the words eventually became synonymous. Pelinor's triumph at Sancrator was so intense that it erupted from within his quivering red chest. He threw Haramir upon the stones and stood over him like an overlord. The king of copper and tea cowered, awaiting a swift execution by the blade. But Pelinor was overcome by the occasion, and his ire was dire that day. The so-called knight fell upon him like a beast, clawing through cloth and silk and jewellery through all the layers of elven superiority, until Haramir's neck was exposed. In his final moments, the king saw Pelinor's human face and his inhuman stare, and then Pelinor ate his neck veins like a rabid dog, and when the king was dead, he tilted his pale face toward the heavens, and with strips of skin and sinew between his teeth, he released a torrent of triumph that rang through time. The word he screamed was Reman, Yet not a living soul at the Tor knew that name. 
In the wake of that future name, Pelinal Whitestrake tore across the heartland, reaping the harvest of alien brutality. Gordhauer the Shaper's head was smashed upon the goat-faced altar of Ninandava, and in his wisdom, Pelinor said a small plague spell to keep that evil from reforming by Welkin magic. Later that season, Pelinor slew Hud Hall on the granite steps of Sayatar, the Fire King spears knowing their first refute. For a time, no weapon of the Aeliads could pierce his armour, which Pelinor admitted was unlike any crafted by men but would say no more, even when pressed. Pelinor did not always fight alone. Granted, he was not the easiest to follow. One of his titles, Pelinor the Blamer, was given to him because he was so quick to admonish those allies of his who favoured tactics that ran counter to his own. And there was the matter of his questionable humanity. Rumours of Pelinor's immortality simmered, and any mortal would be justified in wondering whether the Star-Made Knight could empathise with the fragility of mortal life. But contrary to these whispers, Pelinor was as passionate in his love for humankind as he was for slaying elves. In his journey across Sirid, Pelinor scouted for worthy warriors among the liberated slaves. One such example was Huna, whom Pelinor raised from grain slave to hoplite. Pelinor had spied Huna in the fields, cutting wheat with a scythe, and had noted the slave's deft hands at work. And Pelinor never failed to detect potential. There was no man in Pelinor's company more skilled with a spear than Huna, and the knight loved him well. Many times in the rebellion, it was Huna who softened Pelinor's facets of fury and bloodlust. But when Huna took death from an arrowhead made from the beak of Selafel the singer, the White Strake went on his first madness. He wrought destruction from Nalame all the way to Celadil, and erased those lands from the maps of elves and men, and all things in them, and Perif was forced to make sacrifice to the gods to keep them from leaving the world in their disgust. And when finally Pelinor's wrath subsided, and that force within him akin to adrenaline left his circuitry system, the star-made knight felt an emotion as powerful as the love he had had for Huna. Only this emotion was more excruciating than any physical wound. He felt loss, and the strength of this grief attuned Pelinor to an extraterrestrial signal, reaching him from another universe entirely. As a mere mortal, I cannot tell you what transmission Pelinor received, nor whether it is the same as the one I'm about to share with you. But humour me while I share a quote from our own universe, from one C.S. Lewis. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, Dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. And upon receiving this cosmic message, or another message entirely, Pelinor Whitestrake showed the humans his heart, full of love and madness. Beneath the Pelinor's star armor was a chest that gaped open to show no heart, only a red rage shaped diamond fashion singing like a mindless dragon. Some saw this as proof he was a god, but Pelinor cared for none of this, and killed any who would speak god logic, except for fair Perif, who he said, enacts rather than talks, as language without exertion is dead witness. Despite Pelinor's mercurial threats, the men who followed him could not help but wonder what kind of being he was. Some, like Plontanu, who favoured the short sword, said that Pelinor was a Shezarine, and that night he was smothered by moths. Among the many iterations of the creation story, there is one which suggests that after his defeat at the hands of Trinamac and Auriel, Lorcan was cracked asunder. His cloven duality became the two moons, Massa and Secunda, the two halves of Lorcan's flesh divinity. Like Lorcan, Pelinor was a walking dichotomy, the intensity of his love was accentuated by the intensity of his madness. When these fits of anger and nonsense overcame Pelinor, he would fall into the madness, and laugh and swing his sword wildly, 
running into the reign of kind to slaughter more aliens. Reports would soon return to Elysia stating that whole swaths of land were devoured in divine rampage to become void, and Elysia would have to pray to the gods for their succor, and they would reach down as one mind and soothe the White Strake until he no longer had the will to kill the Earth in whole. And yet, as if at random, Pelinor's passion may manifest as tenderness. Like with the Man Bull, it is a solid truth that Morahouse was the son of Kine, and the two talked of each other as family, with Morahouse as the lesser, and that Pelinor loved him and called him nephew. But these could be merely the fancies of immortals. Never did Pelinor counsel Morahouse in times of war, for the Man Bull fought magnificently and led men well and never resorted to madness. But the White Strake did warn against the growing love with Perith. We are Arda more, and change things through love. We must take care, lest we beget more monsters on this earth. If you do not desist, she will take to you, and you will transform all Sirid if you do this. And to this the bull became shy, for he was a bull, and he felt his form too ugly for the Paravania at all times, especially when she disrobed for him. He snorted though, and shook his nose hoop into the light of the Secunda moon and said, She is like this shine on my nose hoop here, an accident sometimes, but whenever I move my head at night, she is there, and so you know that what you ask is impossible. These moments of beauty were like chips of diamond in a wall of volcanic rock and there would be little time for love after the response from the city of white gold. The Star Maid Knight could not be allowed to freely slaughter every king of Sirid one by one. So, the Aeliads had made pact with the Aurorans of Meridia, and summoned them, and appointed the terrible and golden-hued half-elf Umaril the Unfeathered as their champion. And for the first time since his coming, it was Pelinor who was called out to battle by another, for Umaril had the blood of the Arda, and would never know death. With the rise of Umaril, the ballad of the Star Maid Knight approaches its final stanza. So let us pause for a moment to hear another word from our sponsor, the Library of Dusk's rare book collection. For complete access to over infinity and eight never before read texts, each of which guaranteed to cause amnesia, insanity, or zero sum, please visit the Library of Dusk in Cold Harbor, just west of the Hollow City. Today's excerpts come from the only known existing copy of Conversations with the Heart of Lorcan by Pelinor Whitestrake. Warning, the apocryphal ruminations held within these pages should be consumed at one's own risk. Chapter 2, Mortalitas. On the eve of battle, I often heard men enthralled in the throes of night terrors. I sometimes peered through tent flaps to see my most courageous soldiers paralyzed by fear at horrors that must have felt as tangible as the sweat pouring from their brows. These finite beings needed rest, yet their souls never ceased experiencing a universe that was far beyond their ability to comprehend. The Ardor are quick to admonish my father for the limitation he brought into every corner of the Mundus. And yet, mortal men gazed into the cosmos and felt tiny, insignificant under the weight of its majesty. In some sense, this fueled my hatred for Elfkind, and my unfaltering love of mankind. The Aeliads and their forebears rue their mortality, believing themselves to be hereditary descendants of the Aedra. In some respects, that is true, but here on Tamriel they are given free will, and they reject it in favour of the endless brightness of Aetherius. They know not what they want, for that light is overwhelming and lacks nuance and yet they seek it because mortality is weakness, and they believe they can regain their divinity by profaning Lorcan's wondrous creation. By enslaving, by brutalizing, by dominating, becoming little more than the pettiest of Oblivion's infernal lords. Men, however, are ever grateful for the gift of life, and they cherish it all the more for its transience. So when I see their oblivious minds try to unravel the mysteries of the Mundus, I envy them. For it is sublime, and the rapture of it lies in the incomprehensible immensity of it. Those dreaming men would wake at dawn, hearts pounding, euphoric, thankful for the return of reality. I have no need for rest. My heart doesn't need sleep or sustenance. So long as Mundus lived, my diamond core would continue its drone. 
So when I came before my maker's heart again, I asked him how my stony chest could feel such love for Huna and Morahouse and Perif and all those men I led. And the intensity of my hatred for their oppressors burned just as bright as that love, running adjacent to it. And he answered me in profound palpitations. He is the spirit of Nern, the heart of the world. His lifeblood flows as magma through the crust of the earth. And this subterranean pressure creates fissures through which volcanic springs emerge, providing pure water, rich in vitality, that when mixed with the light of Magnus, allows life to burgeon. This is but one example of how every mortal born in the Mundus is a child of Lorcan, and I was born from a drop of the god's own unadulterated blood. And thus, I loved all of Nern's children like my own, and chastised all who rejected my father's gift. Lorcan's affinity for mankind radiates in my chest. His love is subtle, but mine is palpable. Finally, he told me one last truth. My love is too powerful for this world, and as I warned Morahouse, I too would change things. Even if injustices are abundant, that is the nature of free will, and my involvement should only be for times of great need. He told me I would need to die soon, a symbolic death that would inspire hope though I knew my love would bring me back time and time again. Umaril had called out Pelinor, and the star-made knight answered not with words, but with his gartok, his weapon hand. Pelinor drove the sorcerer armies past the Nibbon, claiming all the eastern lands for the rebellion of the Paravania, and he broke the doors open for the prisoners of the Vartash, with the slave queen flying on Mora House above them, and men called her Al-Esh for the first time. He liberated the Thousand Strong of Sidor, a Nedic tribe captured by the Aliens, and after the first pogrom, which consolidated the northern holdings for the men of Kreef, he stood with white hair gone brown with elf blood at the bridge of Heldon, where Perif's falconers had sent for the Nords, and they, looking at him, said that Shaw had returned, but he spat at their feet for profaning that name. He led them anyway into the heart of the hinterland west, to drive the Aliens inward, towards the Tower of White Gold, a slow retreating circle that could not understand the power of man's sudden liberty, and what fury idea that brought. All the while, the unfeathered one watched from his perch atop the White Gold Tower, sending his Fundanarchs as harriers to terrorise the human advance. But Pelinor crushed each and every one of them beneath his mace. Soon it was time to strategize the assault on the great city, at the Council of Skiffs, where all the Paravania's armies and all of the Nords shook with fear at the storming of the White Gold. So much so that Alesh herself counseled delay. Pelinor grew furious, and made names of Umaril, and made names of what cowards he thought he saw around him, and then made for the tower by himself, for Pelinor often acted without thought. At least, those who advised caution saw Pelinor was faultless. Perhaps Pelinor knew his death was imminent, and he wished to face it as a warrior, clearing a path for the men whose lives were far more precious in their frailty. And so, after many battles with Umaril's allies, where dead Aurorans lay like candlelight around the throne, the Pelinor became surrounded by the last Aeliad Sorcerer Kings and their demons, each one heavy with Valiants. The White Straight cracked the floor with his mace, and they withdrew, and he said, Bring me Umaril that called me out. And while mighty in his aspect and wicked, deathless golden Umaril favoured ruin from afar over close combat, and so he tarried in the shadows of the White Tower before coming forth. The unfeathered king had not been idle while Pelinor wrought ruination upon his people's empire. He had heard that the Star Maid Knight's armour was impenetrable, so Umaril had been hoarding long valiance. No doubt after conversing at length with the Glister Witch, Meridia. The Aeliads, though their legacy was sullied by the worship of profane spirits, were experts in the arcane. They discovered that starlight was the purest form of magicka, and they used meteoric iron, collected from fallen ethereal fragments, to construct wells to store this potent magic, and meteoric glass to cut repositories for it. In their language, Aeliadun, they called star magic Valiants. This long Valiance was matured starlight, the refined energy of Magnus and the Magna Ghi. It is said that Magicka has no limitation in the mortal realm, because the god of magic and his children fled moments before Lorcan's trap was sprung. 
Umaril had also heard the rumours that Pelennor was an aspect of Lorcan, a Shezarine. Thus he theorised that Magnus's magic could defy the power of the trickster, because Magnus was not compelled to abide by the constrictions of the Mundus. So, when Umaril sent forth more soldiers as fodder for the heartless beast in white, their axes and arrows, steeped in long valiants, actually penetrated his armour. Pelennor was pierced in many places, but amid a sea of golden corpses, the star-made knight stood resilient, unmoving as an obelisk. Only then did Umaril come down from his perch. The half-elf showed himself, bathed in meridian light. And he listed his bloodline in the Aelia Dune and spoke of his father, a god of the previous Kalpa's world river, and taking great delight in the heavy breathing of Pelennor who had finally bled. Umaril draped his featherless form in intoxicating swells of valiance and self-assurance. He emboldened himself with memories of the World River and of the dawn when Pelennor's god Lorcan was riven by his gods, Trinomach and Oriel. They had torn out his heart and Umaril would do the same, reclaiming the Kim El Adabal for the Aeliads, restoring their highest glory. And with that, the two god echoes came together. Their swords collided with the force of dragons breaking, and the land of Dawn's beauty fell into an everlasting ephemeral moment of chronostasis. What came next could have lasted seconds, it could have lasted days. As far as the gods are concerned, from their perpetual places in the orbits, the time it took is arbitrary. The annals of history reflect this, as the moment of climax in the Song of Pelennor was lost or never written. If this song has a crescendo, then it is not meant for our ears. The Song of Pelennor proceeds to say, Umaril was laid low, the angel face of his helm dented into an ugliness which made Pelennor laugh, and his unfeathered wings broken off with sword strokes delivered while Pelennor stood frothing above him, insulting his ancestry and anyone else that took ship from old Elnafe, which angered the other elvish kings and drove them to a madness of their own. Though Pelennor did laugh, this time he was not in the throes of madness. He was perfectly lucid, like an enlightened dreamer. He ignited the flames of madness in the Aeliads instead, and they fell upon him, cutting him into apes. Pelennor had come alone, and he had died alone. But the might of Morahouse, Elysia, and the Nedic Rebellion were not far behind, and vengeance was carried east on Kine's winds. The Sorcerer Kings ran when Moore shook the whole of the tower with mighty bashing from his horns the next morning, and some were slain in overabundance in the taking, and men looked for more Aeliads to kill, but Pelennor had left none, save those kings and demons that had already begun to flee. It was Morahouse who found the White Strake's head, which the kings had left to prove their deeds, and they spoke, and Pelennor said things of regret. But the rebellion had turned anyway and more words were said between these immortals that even the Paravant would not deign to hear. And with that, the Elysian Rebellion was over, and the Slave Queen was now the Empress of a new empire of men. Elysia knew such a title required a change in mindset. The Slave Queen was full of fervour, and Pelennor had embodied her passionate pursuit of freedom. But as Empress, Elysia needed to be diplomatic and magnanimous to her subjects even those who had done little to aid her in her rise to prominence. Most important of all, she needed a religion befitting a cosmopolitan empire, a pantheon that would be accepted by the Nords, but also by the Elves, and even some of the Nedic humans worshipped a concoction of Elven and human gods. The most divisive god was without a doubt Shor Lorcan. The text titled Shazar and the Divines by Faustilius Junius elaborates on this, stating, he could no longer be the bloodthirsty anti aldma warlord of old. He could not disappear altogether either, or the Nords would have withdrawn their support of her rule. In the end, he had become the spirit behind all human undertaking. Even though this was merely a thinly disguised, watered-down version of Shaw, it was good enough for the Nords. So, the chief of the Nordic pantheon became Shazar, a lesser-known god by imperial standards. He was hidden behind the new religion of the Eight Divines, which was a consolidation of the major elven and Nordic deities into a recognisable, memorable and innocuous octagon. The Aeliads had foretold this dethroning of Shaw when they tore Pelennor into eight pieces, 
It was symbolic of Lorcan being buried beneath the Eight Divines. However, I believe Alicia honoured Pelennor in secret, for she smuggled something starkly human into her new religion. The chief of the Divines was Akatosh, and what separates Akatosh from Auriel lies in his imperial depiction. Akatosh is not just the Time Dragon, he actually has two heads, and the second head is the head of a man. It is my theory that Shaw is still the head of the Empire of Men, operating safely behind the guise of Akatosh the Time God, his historic rival. And this notion is supported by the covenant between Akatosh and Alicia. The text titled Trials of Saint Alicia states, Akatosh made a covenant with Alicia in those days so long ago. He gathered the tangled skeins of oblivion, and knit them fast with the bloody sinews of his heart, and gave them to Alicia, saying, This shall be my token to you, that so long as your blood and oath hold true, yet so shall my blood and oath be true to you. This token shall be the amulet of kings, and the covenant shall be made between us, for I am the king of spirits, and you are the queen of mortals. As you shall stand witness for all mortal flesh, so shall I stand witness for all immortal spirits. And Akatosh drew from his breast a burning handful of his heart's blood, and he gave it into Elysia's hand, saying, This shall also be a token to you of our joined blood and pledged faith. So long as you and your descendants shall wear the Amulet of Kings, then shall this dragon fire burn, an eternal flame, as a sign to all men and gods of our faithfulness. So long as the dragon fire shall burn, to you and to all generations, I swear that my heart's blood shall hold fast the gates of oblivion. In light of this, I ask you, dear listener, which of the gods has a vested interest in seeing the mortal realm of Mundus endure? That god would be sure Lorcan. And whose blood is imbued with the Kim El Adabal, the gemstone in the Amulet of Kings? That would be sure Lorcan and whose wife gave that very gemstone to Alicia in the form of a star-made knight. That would be sure Lorcan, through his wife Kyne. This covenant between Akatosh and Alicia was Lorcan's doing, for Lorcan's heart is the heart of the world, for one was made to satisfy the other. As Pelennor Whitestrake died, he roared with confusion, and I believe this morphed into revelation, for his fate was also the fate of his father. As Pelennor was severed into eight pieces, he realised Lorcan too would be severed into eighths. Lorcan would die again as his people forgot the major role he had played by sending an aspect of himself to aid in the victory of the rebellion. But Lorcan has always manipulated the Mundus in secret, and Pelennor was not the only Shezarine. For Elysia's empire to endure, Shaw needed to go into hiding, and Akatosh was to be his masquerade. His rival, Auriel, was the unlikeliest of disguises, and through Akatosh, Auriel and Shaw were bound together. With Akatosh in charge, a great deal of bloodshed could be avoided. And now, for one final excerpt from Pelennor's conversations with the heart of Lorcan. Chapter 3 Deus Walt I stood once more before my father, and this time I had no questions. I knew God's will, and I accepted it. I had fought elven tyrants for centuries, but times had changed. With my victory over Umril, the Age of Elves was truly at an end, and for Alicia to bring peace to Tamriel, I had to depart. Of course, I would falter sometimes. I returned in spirit to be at Alicia's deathbed, to guide her to heaven, and I returned in secret to witness the glory of Riemann, my diamond heart heavy with pride. But I never return in full and though I envied men for their ability to sleep, and dream, and ponder forces far greater than themselves, I realised now that I'd been living the dream, and I was lucid. Men could only fantasise about possessing the power that I had wielded, and I was the embodiment of their fantasies. But my purpose was at an end, and there was a time where such a revelation would have driven me to madness. But now I see things more clearly. It is like when the dream no longer needs its dreamer. And so, I snuff my killing light, and pass into legend.